Great. Thank you, Raghav. And uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, nice to virtually chat with everyone. Thank you for coming to, to learn more about smart contracts and blockchains. Uh, the topic we're going to be discussing is specifically how smart contracts influence the asset management industry and how they will act as a superior single source of truth. How them acting as a superior so source of truth, single source of truth, will begin to change the structure of the global financial markets, how that change in structure will then influence the asset ma management industry in its ability to manage risk in relation to its assets, gain access to new assets, and reduce oper operational costs and fees. So here is a basic diagram of what a smart contract is. It consists of code running on a network of computers that's beyond the control of any one party, private key holders which sign approving certain transactions, and also oracles that essentially input data into those contracts at a very high level of security and reliability. We work uh, primarily on the oracles and enabling the interaction between the contract and both external data and enterprise systems. But before we jump into some of the more um, interesting details of how the technical aspect of that works, I think it might be useful to create some more shared context around why this is significant for the asset management industry. It probably benefits us to try to understand the, the current environment in certain categories of assets um, large categories with billions, sometimes trillions um, worth of assets and, and how those categories function. I, I think what you basically see is a lot of fragmentation. So you see huge, uh, huge fragmentation across silos of data. You have silos of data in the individual institutions participating in asset transactions. Then you have middlemen um, technology companies that seek to impose standards because they eventually want to extract monopoly rent. So they want to, to, to make a, a messaging standard of some kind or, or an API standard of some kind. And if they're not member owned, then they seek to eventually arrive at a for-profit extraction of monopoly rents, right? Um, and this increases both the complexity for the internal risk assessment and management of assets, which increases the costs, which are then passed over to your users. But, but even beyond all that, you, you have a world right now where Everybody has their own database. There's a few re repo systems or a few other software providers where people that sit between asset managers and the issuers of the assets and other parties. And it's, it's hugely inefficient. It creates systemic financial risk. It creates huge amounts of costs for the asset managers, actually. And the fascinating thing for me is that the asset manager has massive purchasing power. So the asset manager has an ability to impose certain structural changes on the market by virtue of purchasing power alone. And I, I think one of the things I'd wanna talk through is why you would want to impose certain structural changes as somebody with purchasing power because it benefits you as um, an asset manager, not an asset issuer, uh, and, and not somebody who, who does something else in the financial markets like making money off transactions or being a middleman, right? Like a lot of these assets end at your uh, kind of holding companies and, and in your hands. So I, I think you're in a kind of, kind of a unique position in, and probably one of the largest beneficiaries of this shift to a single source of truth. So a single source of truth is really the value proposition. It's the outcome that blockchains seek to deliver. And they, they deliver this differently in different markets. In supply chains, they deliver it in one way. In financial markets, in another way. In insurance markets, it, it, there's a third way in which a single source of truth is providing uh, basically transparency about what's going on with an asset and the ability to continually update a single record, right? So if you don't have a single record that all the parties trust, then everybody's keeping their own record. And my record might have information your record doesn't have. And now I have to get it to you, but I might not be able to get it to you. Or I get it to you, but you don't have that format. So now you don't have the information. However, if we all have a single source of truth that we all trust, we can all append it with additional useful information. And is this appending of additional useful information into a single shared source of truth, it's often called a golden source of truth, uh, which is what blockchains seek to achieve. And they seek to achieve it in a way that doesn't extract monopoly rent. So it's not a technology provider putting you on their for-profit private system to extract monopoly rent in the long term. It's 
kind of like Linux. So it's, it's open source and it's, it's, it's almost a public, it, it is a public good and it's going to evolve into a public good regardless because a single source of truth for the financial markets or the insurance industry is, um, is so important that it'll eventually become a public good. The closest analogy to what you have in the financial markets are member owned um, kind of computational and data storage resources, which I think have already expressed that they're going to be moving to a blockchain based model. Um, and it's very possible they might instantiate something, something like this, uh, or there'll be an open source standard. It's, it's, it's hard to say, but I, I, in either case, in, in every geography, it's definitely going in this direction. So in every, in every significant geography with real financial assets volume, uh, in Asia, China, in the US, uh, you, you see more and more people going towards the single source of truth model. So if you didn't know why blockchains and smart contracts are of particular importance, they are of extreme importance because they create a structural change in how people relate to assets. And I'm going to go into how that you know, has a fundamental effect on, on both risk and, uh, and returns uh, in, in the subsequent slides. So the, the benefits are, once again, that you have a huge increase in efficiency because you have a single record that everybody can add to. People aren't keeping their own separate records that other people don't trust because it's not their record, it's someone else's. Uh, you have superior risk management because the single source of truth can now include all this useful information and everybody can trust it because it is that single source of uh, information that, that people can trust. You, you, you start to have a resource where people can add relevant information and other people can rely on that relevant information without having huge counterparty risk. And that creates um, an informational dynamic to assess risk that's superior to what exists now, where if somebody doesn't want to share information, or even if somebody does share information, you might not trust it. It has cybersecurity built in uh, at a foundational level. It uh, goes towards a zero trust dynamic. So what, what this means is that cybersecurity is more important than ever. It's ex exceptionally important in asset management and actually also in showing certain degrees of solvency and having people rely on that. And it's very difficult to add cybersecurity as a band-aid. You, you kind of have to start from certain fundamental foundational assumptions and build a system with those assumptions in mind, and that's how you get real cybersecurity. Adding band-aids um, is, is a very difficult thing to do, and very few people can actually do that uh, even relatively well. The other thing is that enables permissionless innovation. So by eliminating middlemen that would traditionally create these assets for you, or at least allowing more uh, fintechs or other parties to create the assets, possibly even the, the original asset uh, owner, like an insurance company or reinsurer, uh, you open up the competition for people to generate more assets for you. And not only more assets, but assets better in their information quality for you to assess their risk and value and assets that can be more efficiently delivered to you at lower cost and settled with you faster and transferred to counterparties if you wanna sell them fast, right? So you, you don't have to wait for days or sometimes weeks for certain assets to move, you can um, settle them in, in, in minutes and seconds. Uh, if these are large uh, values, then you know, the float you would have made on that would have been quite significant and, and, and there's a number of other dynamics there. But you, you basically have the ability for more people to participate in the creation of assets that meet the high standards you have and it creates competition. And that competition gives you more assets to purchase with better informational quality uh, at greater efficiency and cost, which uh, I think it's very um, notable and honorable that you guys seek to pass that on to your users. So at the end of the day, that efficiency goes and greatly benefits the users and their interaction with these assets. I think one useful thing to do to put this more into perspective is to quickly run through one example that uh, I think we're all familiar with. It's the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, obviously it has layers upon layers of complexity of what happened there in different uh, cases, institutions, scenarios. But at a very fundamental level from a data and a record keeping point of view, you, you really had a situation where you had people going into one institution, uh, generating a record about their credit worthiness, um, gaining a loan. That record partially making its way to another institution like an investment bank or, or, or somewhere where the, the individual loans became packaged up. And then eventually those packaged loans with even less information now made their way to asset managers. And this was, in my opinion, one of the largest factors, in addition to incentives and a few other things, that created this crisis. It's basically because the people that had the, the relevant data didn't transfer it 
Um, or even if they wanted to transfer more data that they would have accrued, they weren't able to, or they wouldn't have been able to. And this lack of data transferability created a huge, huge gap in the understanding of both credit risk assessment agencies and asset managers, creating a huge, not only systemic financial risk, but also loss to asset managers and uh, the people that, the, the users, right? At the end of the day, the, in many cases, the retail user, not to mention the huge systemic financial risk. So this, um, this is one of the flaws of this system. It's, it's, it's an inability to properly assess risk because information isn't reliably transferred because there isn't a container in which to transfer it. Everybody has their own container and they take a little piece out and they send it to the next person, but there's a bunch of information left in their container and they just don't have a way to transfer it in a way that that person can trust or wants to trust or wants to utilize. Conversely, in a single source of truth uh, model using smart contracts, the loan origi originator would have had people come in. They would have generated individual smart contracts for each loan holder. They could have appended additional data to that contract like their FICO score, which could have been automatically updated on an annual basis. So it could have automatically been appended to each individual record. Those individual records can then at a much greater uh, efficiency and therefore at a lower cost be packaged up by people who securitize and make the asset back securities like investment banks. And very importantly, the final assets that make their way to the asset manager in the larger market are transparent. So you don't have a basket of a million assets and who knows and they're rated how they're rated, who knew how they rated them, okay, we trust them for ratings. It's, it's based on being able to dig in to the incremental detailed view of every single loan holder because you have a container that moves from institution to institution with each additional um, important insight that an institution has being able to be appended to it. And then when it finally reaches the market, you have a huge breadth and depth of data on each individual um, asset and its value and, its and actually its underlying dynamics. And it is this interaction with detailed data that not only mitigates risk, but also allows asset managers to interact with more advanced assets, more advanced products, because now the quality of the data is so clear on a, an asset by asset basis. And it's so proven to be true that you can have all kinds of new assets generated at a, at a much higher rate of efficiency. So the, the way this would have solved the, the 2008 financial crisis is that if each individual person would have had their own smart contract, that smart contract as a container would have moved from the loan originator to the investment bank and then to the asset manager, along the way being appended by FICO credit scores, other credit scores, um, other data that's relevant to that specific individual contract. And, and in my opinion, uh, this may not have completely stopped the crisis, but it would have definitely softened the boom and bust cycle. So the, the, the leverage credit cycle there would have been significantly softened if the market and specifically you as asset managers had the ability to look into the underlying assets fundamentals at, uh, at a very high degree of accuracy, which, which is what I'm really talking about in the, in the case of a single source of truth. To, to really look at what this single source of truth is made up of, it's made up of three parts. It's made up of the smart contract that's running on a network of computers. That network of computers is different from somebody running a digital agreement in their server, right? So if you run a digital agreement for some kind of financial product on your server, or a bank makes a financial contract and runs it on their server, or you use a financial contract run by a third party software company that charges both of you fees and seeks to eventually arrive at a place where they'll extract monopoly rents from both of you. Um, that is not beyond the control of any one party and therefore people don't trust it, right? If it's in the control of the bank, people have less trust in it. If it's in control of someone else, people have less trust in it. The, the, the whole point is that you have a single source of truth, a financial contract that is running in a network of computers beyond the control of any of the participants. And this is the unique property of smart contracts. They should really be called tamper-proof digital agreements because they, they provide this unique property of there's a single source of truth, there's a financial contract that is beyond the control of the participants. And that is why you trust it, because it is beyond the manipulation of any one participant for their financial gain. Then you have private keys, and private keys is part of where you have security baked in at a foundational level. So these blockchains and smart contracts are actually rooted very deeply in, in basic cryptographic primitives. And their use of private keys is something that is 
not unique, but it's it's definitely a step up from from for how some financial infrastructure works today, where you basically have the ability for people to sign uh, in a cryptographically proven manner while retaining some amount of privacy from their devices. And, and this is really the way that a lot of financial transactions that have high value do get signed and how really all financial contracts should work is on a private key basis. So that's, that's baked in. Then you have the Oracle mechanism and the Oracle mechanism is the way that data interacts with smart contracts. So smart contracts are in fact so secure and so kind of locked down that they cannot interact with external systems. The only thing they can actually interact with is these private keys which sign transactions. And, and this is the, the important point to really understand about why smart contracts have maybe not taken off yet. So smart contracts have immensely valuable properties as a single source of truth. They have the capacity to generate tokens that represent other assets and get those tokens moved around. They have embedded private key signing capabilities for uh, movement towards zero trust security dynamics. But what they don't have is the ability to interact with external systems. And this is the problem that we're solving and why many people work with us around how do I take smart contracts into the world of interaction with my ex existing in internal systems and with the data that I know that a contract of a certain type needs to interact. So you should really think of smart contracts or what we call universally connected smart contracts, which is the ones you're primarily interested in. Um, as consisting of two parts, an on-chain part, which is the contract code that actually defines the financial contract, and then the off-chain components, such as the enterprise systems that might trigger something in the contract, the traditional payments rails that the contract might wanna send payments over, and very often the external data about market events that determine the contract's underlying value and change in value. And really, these are equally important parts, and it is the emergence of something called an Oracle, which is what we make, that has now taken or is taking contracts into a new stage of their growth and evolution into their more advanced stage of being universally connected. And, and this is really the important uh, maybe point to understand that even though they're called smart contracts, they should really be called digital uh, tamper-proof digital agreements, right? And they, they are extremely tamper-proof, they are extremely reliable, but they cannot connect to external systems. This is by design to maintain their security. They can't connect to market data, events data, enterprise systems, or bank payments. People that would sell you some kind of blockchain in a box and it's just running on a single server and has some APIs, um, that doesn't provide these tamper-proof guarantees. So you, if, if you want the actual single source of truth dynamics that blockchains provide, you're going to have a limited set of things they can do on a transactional level. You can write certain things with them in terms of logic but you, you are going to need um, almost a blood-brain barrier. You're going to need another layer to connect all the inputs and all the outputs into the blockchain and into the contracts. And this is the thing that people don't necessarily know um, because they're called smart contracts and smart implies connectivity. It implies you know, smart cards, smart cars, smart homes. But in the case of smart contracts, it's really tamper-proof digital agreements that are a superior single source of truth and to reach their full potential, they need this connectivity. That's what we work on. Uh, that's why a lot of financial institutions, banks, insurance companies are excited to work with us because we enable this next stage of universally connected uh, smart contracts. The, the other important dynamic that, that we saw for is that because we're connected to many different blockchains, we help people with a very important decision of how do I connect to the right blockchain? And this is an especially difficult decision and difficult dynamic for um, multinational asset managers like you, because the assets you're going to want to have access to, even if uh, it, the assets you're going to have access to are going to be distributed on a number of different blockchains. I could basically guarantee you that right now. Tomorrow or next year, there won't be a single blockchain that all the assets are on. And even if you, even if you, when you do see a consolidation around single source of truth standards in specific geographies, even then you will still have a difference among geographies until we finally globally come to a single source of truth, just like we globally use the internet, right? That's gonna take some time. Um, so a multinational asset manager has a very big question to, to solve for itself of what blockchain am I gonna to connect to? And it's very difficult to answer that question right now because a lot of the blockchains that you're gonna to wanna to connect to may not even be live yet. They may still be in development. 
There are blockchains you want to connect to because they might have certain assets you want. And, and that dynamic is going to continue. You're going to continue to see a massive amount of new blockchains, different by geography, different by asset class, that you're going to want to connect to as an asset manager to properly you know, transact on and be able to offer those, uh, those assets that, that have this superior dynamic. This is another thing that we make possible because we connect to all of the different blockchains. So we don't only provide the ability to put data and connect to outbound payment systems. We actually act as a bridge from your internal enterprise systems that you want to retain because you've built workflows on top of them. They already control lots of value. You have backend services that it's be extremely difficult to pull out. And you want to connect all of that systematized kind of learning and uh, backend service work to blockchains as an environment where you want to conduct commerce. And, and this is really what we enable by our connection to hundreds of blockchains. We already have uh, over 50 of them announced. Many of them are integrated, going live. Many are live. And um, this trend is only continue, going to continue. So instead of a uh, multinational asset manager like you or really other large enterprises, getting a blockchain team for every blockchain that they think they might want to be on, which is going to be unbelievably difficult because the communities are small uh, for many of even the really exciting blockchains that are up and coming. And even for the ones that are already have lots of assets on them, it's already, a ch it's still a challenge to get good developers there. So instead of having 50 or hundred blockchain teams for each blockchain that you might want to conduct commerce on or, or, or own assets on, it, it really is a more kind of risk adjusted approach to simply have a blockchain capability built into your backend through a secure blockchain middleware. And this is the other big problem that we solve for enterprises of how do I connect to all the blockchains where I would need to conduct commerce, own assets, uh, trigger transactions, or understand what's going on in those blockchains. One of the things that, uh, that all of this kind of enables is not only greater efficiency for, for you as an asset manager, but it also enables the existence of entirely new assets that provide better information and, and much lower costs to you as holders and, and, and subsequently to your users as, as holders. At, at the end of the day, what smart contracts act as is an extremely trustworthy digital container about an asset. And it's a digital container that from our 2008 financial crisis example can move between institutions and therefore it's actually worth it to add more data to it because if you add data to it that data will underpin the value of that container and also kind of accent the value of the underlying asset and so people have a reason to add more more important information to that container because they know it won't be lost when it goes to the next holder right it won't get lost when it goes to the next institution that happened to own the asset It'll continue to move between institutions and you can keep adding data to it. In, in this case, I think what we're illustrating is a very exciting class of assets that uh, we think has have a very bright future in the form of insurance and securitized insurance, where you have solar panel fields, as one example, that have been insured. The energy price markets are, uh, you know, let's say they get better and better. And then you arrive at a place where you have premium payments going into a single uh, source of truth digital container. That digital container knows the status of the underlying asset through IoT data about whether the solar panels are active and performing in terms of their expected capacity for generating energy. It can also know about the energy price markets. And so it can actually have a, a certain sense of the health of the underlying asset, whether a certain solar panel field is solvent based on the energy price mark, uh, energy prices in that specific region. And, and then it can, and, and it can continue to acquire all this information on a solar panel field by solar panel field basis. So an extremely granular level of data about the underlying asset collected extremely securely and very efficiently on an ongoing basis without human intervention. So extreme data quality at extremely low cost, that's ungameable and, uh, and provides immediate transparency to you, the asset manager, and even transparency that you can then provide to your users. So if your users happen to want to understand exactly what their underlying assets are, this can flow all the way to your users having clarity on what is going on with their money, which I personally think is gonna be a huge uh, 
advantage in the, in, in, in the medium term. And then all of the details from each of these individual assets flows into an asset-backed security that, by the way, because you have so many high-quality individual asset uh, co smart contracts, the composition of that into an asset-backed security is both done more efficiently, it's, it's something that can be granular, so you can actually ask to have certain assets removed, other assets added, and it eliminates the fees and all the other dynamics with middlemen. So if, if you go down to the lowest possible level of generating an asset that's going to reach the securities markets in a way that that asset is composable into other baskets of assets, that's really where you would start if you want to create maximum efficiency, right? You would make the, the smallest unit of value as composable as it possibly could be and then composing it into various baskets um, or, or asset-backed securities is, is no longer a high-cost, uh, drawn-out activity. And so your interaction with the middlemen and the other systems and services that you as an asset manager rely on fundamentally changes. Not because you go and, and, you, and you say, like, I want it better, but because there's a structural change in how the, the entire system of contracts in relation to these assets functions. And it is this fundamental change in how this system of contracts functions and that the, the smallest unit of value has now become so reliable and composable and driven by high quality data that, that leads to this fundamental change. But the, the, the really big dynamic, I think, is that the asset managers that are able to add not only new assets, but greater efficiencies will be more competitive. And I actually think that the asset managers of the world should push this dynamic because at the end of the day, they're huge beneficiaries of it. They don't have any need to be middlemen that generate these assets. They don't have any need to make money on fees from the transactional volume of like moving them around. Do you wanna hold the assets and you wanna give them to your users at, at um, a, a fair price and at a high level of security and at a high level of risk mitigation? And, um, and this is what is enabled by this at the, the maximum degree possible. The, the other dynamic that I think is worth mentioning is that in the long term, I think what this really arrives at is a peer-to-peer -peer transactional model. Once you, as uh, an asset management industry, get to a highly composable set of very small pieces of value, uh, down to the individual mortgage, down to the individual solar panel field, down to the individual sales from a car dealership and, and, and how the, that revenue from those sales flows into an asset-backed security. Then you basically get some amount of permissionless innovation. You have fintechs and digital banks and others composing all these assets uh, for you at, at greater speeds at lower costs. And you eventually arrive at a model where peer-to-peer -peer transactions across asset managers become much more common. And the, the settlement times go down the clarity about the assets goes up and those extreme operational efficiencies then are passed on to your users under, under the model that you have of, of having a lot of high volume users that not only do you provide efficient access to these assets and markets in many different geographies and many new assets, but you provide it in a way where the, the, the systemic financial risk is lower to the global market, the quality of data available to your users about their holdings is better. Your ability to assess risk is greater. And the, the, the key building block for this is really how are you as asset managers and holders of these assets and, and people that interact with these assets going to both drive this forward and interact with this infrastructure. So there is a very important dynamic around how do I interact with that infrastructure? And that's really where we seek to help. So we seek to provide a secure blockchain middleware that allows you to keep your current workflows and user interfaces, which you've trained many people on, and your backend systems and services, and basically allows you to take an enterprise event, such as you know, generate transaction for movement of asset, turn that into a blockchain transaction, blockchain transaction happens, the secure middleware monitors the blockchain of choice for that transaction and returns an update back into your enterprise system in the format that your enterprise system consumes already. 
So this means you get to keep your workflows, you get to keep your user interfaces, you get to keep your backend systems, and you get access to the entire universe of blockchains on a multinational level in all the different assets that you would want to interact with. And this is really the, I think one of the big benefits of in the, adopting a blockchain capable strategy. It's not so much in our opinion about choosing like, this is the only blockchain ever, or that is the only blockchain ever. Th that's really gonna be evolving. And it's also gonna be evolving on a geographic basis and in an asset category basis. It's about becoming blockchain capable for, so that when you do want to own assets or you do want to transact in these environments, you are able to transact in those environments securely, efficiently, and in a way that meets the requirements of the blockchain systems themselves. Which, which is a large undertaking, which is what we do. Uh, we do it in an open source way so that you as asset managers can efficiently drive this, this movement forward by, by adopting these new smart contract based assets, which are coming up faster and faster.